with an average of 60, or a 55-55 world with an average of 55. So this kind of takes us to Rawls's Veil of Ignorance, yeah, right? Yeah, this is the infinite sort of inequality aversion scenario. Right. And, I mean, to me... Not to put you on the spot. If I had to be born into this society, yeah. I would, I'd would rather be born into the 56-60, yeah. because the chances of being in the 55 realm, right, are pretty high if I was born into that 55-65 world. And so I'd rather be in a society that's more equal if I have to choose one, and I don't know which one I'll land in. But now, what, if, what if it was the 55-55 society? I didn't give you that option before, but let's say we had a third option where the average is now 55. You have complete equality. Mm. I would say that I'd rather... So here's the reason why, right? The argument, the reason that this argument tends to... or the the main... I'll say the main critique against this, the Rawlsian argument, right, yeah. is that in the maybe even in the 55-65 world, even if you were born in the 55, somehow you could work your well, your, you work your way into the 65. So it's not deterministic for the rest of your life, okay? Right, okay. and there's an incentive to get there, and, and I could get there, right? So if it was money, for example, I'm talking about like instead of 55-65 years of life, I'm talking about 55-65 dollars or yeah. grand, right? right. Fine. Um, somehow maybe if I'm smart enough or I'm good enough or I work hard enough, I can get to the 65 grand. Yep. But the problem is is that very likely if I'm born into the 55-65 world, I also have less money, uh, less resources, and I'm going to die younger. So the chances of me actually getting there right, I see. are much more limited. And my life ends at 55 years old. right? It's over. There's nothing else that I can do. It's not a matter of this 55-65 moniker doesn't extend across an equal lifespan. Right? whereby at least I know I'll be able to enjoy my kid's life and you know, see my grandchildren, etc. This is, this is the number of years I'm going to live. So I have fundamentally fewer years to live. My life is shorter than their lives are. Yeah. Um, and so I'd rather be in a position where you know, we all live as, to a certain degree, and as a society we move forward and improve our life expectancy together, um, rather than being born into a society where you know, there's somebody who's going to live 10 years longer than I will. Yeah. Even if... Even if you know, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll live a little bit longer. Uh, that injustice to me is just unpalatable. Gotcha. So your eta coefficient is infinity, in, um, in the economist speak. In economist speak. Oh, yeah. Take your word Which, for it. That's, that's <laughs> normal people. Um, okay, so that's, that's fascinating. Moving from the, the ridiculously theoretical world that I just portrayed to the more practical, uh, policy-relevant realm, it seems like the discussion that we have been having over the last, say, year in the U.S. Uh, about health care legislation, while it has many complications and many other factors involved, in some ways comes down to a collective decision as to which sort of world we prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it a lot, but I am, I am pretty confident that this, is, this captures the essence, especially being in the UK where we are now and seeing um, the comparisons between different social choices for healthcare care uh, systems. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about, we've talked about this a lot before, just personally, but g give me a little bit of your thoughts on, on the current health care bill uh, and the debate surrounding it maybe in the context of some of the observations you've made while studying here in the UK and also just in Europe in general. Because the US and the, in Europe, pretty different um, underlying philosophies, I'd yeah. say. I mean, in the US, it's well known that we, we believe, quote unquote, in the value of hard work uh, and pulling oneself up by his or her bootstraps. Um, and I think that's, that's been reflected a lot in the way that we we fought out this battle for health reform, and we still are. I mean, yeah. you know, the House just yeah. the passed the, quote unquote, the repeal uh, of the health bill. Um, but the issue is this. You know, I said earlier that I would not be for taking away from one group to give to others. Now, what this health bill attempts to do is fundamentally to cover a large portion of American society who doesn't have access to health care, Right. And now, if we believe that health care does influence the ways and means by which people can be healthy mm -hmm. um, and that it is important for their health, then it would behoove us to cover those people, right? It's, it's unequal, fundamentally, if we don't 
uh, cover them and while the rest of society is, you know, has access to the best care that money can buy, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, and the best care that money can buy in the U.S. is probably some of the best care that money can buy in the world. In the world. I would agree with that. Um, I wouldn't say it is full stop the best care in the world, but I would say it's definitely among the okay. best in the world. Yeah. Um, now, the issue is that we wouldn't necessarily be, quote unquote, stealing from the rich to give to the poor in the U.S. Because the rich will always have the ability right. to pay for the care that they need, right? Right. What it means, though, is that that care would actually have to be paid for um, more explicitly in maybe further added plans uh, than it would be now. So, for example, in the NHS, in, in the UK, there's yeah. the National Health System, uh, National Health Service, excuse me, and there are certain certain types of care that one can't actually get from the NHS, but that if, if one has the means, he or she can purchase um, at market value, right? Yeah. Um, now, in the United States, what we said is we are going to offer um, access to health care among people who, for people who don't actually have it now. Um, and the argument would be that, well, everybody's premiums would go up a little bit. But for the people who actually have premiums now, they're much more likely to be able to... So they're, what they're losing, right, in terms of the added costs on their health plans, right, are more manageable to them than are um, than is the the absolute lack of access to health care yeah. among the people who don't have it now. Yeah, and there are also all these negative externalities associated with having a market based in insurance scheme where you have right selection bias. Right. But anyway, we won't go into that. I mean, continue. there's a huge problem with valuation of health. Right. Is that you don't know? There's an information problem. Right. And a uh, um, what is it that you guys call it? The uh, the fact that you can't necessarily value your health uh, accurately until you don't have it anymore. A time and consistency time problem. Time and consistency problem, right. So you have, you have information problems and time and consistency problems. Yeah. So people don't necessarily know what they're paying for or how much something is worth, what's their, their, right. their marginal utility for uh, a stent, for example, when wow. you know, they, they need it. So your marginal utility for a stent right now is nothing, right? No, it would not help you at all to have a stent. Right. You'd get nothing out of it. Other than just kind of looking at it and, and not even it was cool. Yeah, thinking it was cool, right? <laughs> so very, very tiny, right, marginal utility. But if, hopefully this never happens, you do have a heart attack, your marginal utility skyrockets, right? It's probably infinite. Though. But the problem is you wouldn't even know that it would, it would because you don't know what a stent is. No, your don't. doctor does, yeah. right? So your doctor knows that you need a stent, but that can't necessarily communicate, right, or ask you, okay, so how much is this worth to you? And if he did, if he stopped to ask you, we'd slap him in the face because we'd recognize that that was probably a dumb move for him to do because yeah. time is of the essence, right? right. <laughs> so you have a lot of serious issues where, where the market tends to fail because it doesn't operate in the same way um, that, that it does in, you know, when you're trying to decide whether or not you want to get a pedicure on a yacht with right. Keisha. Right. Um, Poor Keisha. Yeah, she's getting rocked. I bet she's a listener. I bet she is. Um, <laughs> Don't stop <me. laughs> But uh, I agree, and, and again, not to reveal too many of my own leanings on this subject, um, there are also all these what are called adverse selection problems when it comes to insurance, right? When you leave it up to a private market, mm -hmm. um, the insurers have the incentive to jack up premiums for people who have high risk, mm -hmm. right? yep. and, and also people who don't have high risk don't have an incentive to even get insurance yep. unless they have it automatically through their right through their some kind of Cadillac plan or their job. Yeah. So what you have is a amplification of inequality such that people who are more in, more at risk of adverse health effects end up having to pay even more, more. than they would have paid for a quote-unquote fair insurance premium because what's the point of insurance? You're spreading out risk across the entire right. population. Right. But if you're spreading out risk across a risky population, the value of insurance to you as an individual is less. It's just more expensive. Yeah. So anyway, I guess that, so how would you summarize in a nutshell your, how you would compare the two paradigms, if you will, between the U.S. and, and Europe? And I know it's a pretty thorny issue. And yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say, so not all of Europe functions exactly the same way that, sure. um, that the U.K. does, but I would, I would Let's say... Let's just that, use the U.K. for now. I mean, the U.K.'s approach to healthcare is one of the most egalitarian in the world. Uh, doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have. You have access to the same health care as everyone else. Now, 
you know, based on the government system as 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 far as what government will pay for. Um, now, if you do want extra care, well, that's you can go and pay for it at at market rate. Right. Um, and it's interesting because not all health, you know, we talked to the, this question at the beginning, but um, not all health outcomes are as important as others. Yeah. So what people will hit the UK on um, is cancer outcomes and and uh, elective surgery, right? So Athletes have a tough time in the UK. For sure. Athletes have a tough time, right? But if you think about it, I would rather have a bum knee than I would have a heart attack, right? Or, or have, for example, have not get a stent when I needed it. Right. So if I need an MRI, right, for my knee, I'm more okay giving that up than giving up uh, an MRI for my brain or my heart, right? Um, at the same time, for example, cancer care is really, really expensive. But if you think about the people who die of cancer, and I'm talking about over the population now, they tend to be much, much older, right? And so the relative number over a population of lives lost, right, to, to, to poor cancer care is much lower than the number of lives lost to, for example, diabetes or heart disease, right? right? right. Now, in an egalitarian system, a more egalitarian system like the UK's, it can incentivize care for more urgent and, quote, unquote, important outcomes. Now, I don't mean to say, and I'm not saying that, for example, for an individual you know, if, if one's mother has cancer, that that's not important to that person, and that's not even important to me. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that over a population, you have to make decisions about who we're going to put over whom. Yeah. And in this case, what we're saying is it doesn't matter who, it just matters what. Whereas in the U.S., we've gone the entire other way and said it doesn't matter and say it doesn't matter what, it matters whom, right? right? And right. so and so that's a very much less equal system with regard to. Uh, who has access to care and who doesn't. So if you have health insurance, you're going to get everything you need covered, whether that be the MRI for your bum knee or the MRI for your brain, right? right? Whereas if you don't have health insurance, you're getting very little covered, if anything. I mean, the, what you do have recourse to is emergency, emergency. care, yeah. um, which we know is not as ample as, as needed, especially for uh, given the growing burden of chronic disease, which needs chronic care. Yeah. Um, I agree. But in fairness to, um, I guess, the complexity of the debate in the U.S., I would, I would say, and this gets back to some of the things you were saying earlier about the no harm principle, mm -hmm. um, it is much harder to take things away from people when, once they've already had it. And I yeah. think that's a, another part of, another, another reason why the healthcare debate is such a wicked problem in the U.S., wicked because it's just complicated. Um, because I can, I can totally empathize with people who've been used to a system wherein um, if they think something is a little bit messed up with their knee, and obviously this rings somewhat personally to me because, as you know, I do have a bum knee at the moment, um, having the freedom to decide whether or not I want to get an x-ray or an MRI then and there, and then having that freedom even slightly diminished in the name of a more equitable system, um, you have a knee... <laughs> no pun intended, a knee-jerk reaction that says, no, wait a minute, I have this. Don't take this away from me. Right. Now, again, I'm, I agree with you on, on the macro question uh, as to which is a more efficient and equitable and desirable system to a degree. But I, I, guess, I guess I just make that one qualification of I do understand why people in the U.S. at least um, find it difficult a lot of people find it difficult to agree to some of the potential implications, especially when we compare it with European healthcare systems, because they hear all these horror stories about I had to wait three months for an MRI, and we know this to be the case, right? Yeah. Just from our friends. But the thing is, I think we're drawing the wrong counterfactual here. Okay. You have the particular experience of having had the opportunity to experience both healthcare systems sure. in your lifetime, right? We're not. It's not that we're asking everybody to move to England, right? What we are doing and in the in the US is saying we're actually just going to give other people access, right, to what you have and make yours more expensive. We're not asking you to lose access. Mm. We're just making yours more expensive. Right. And not that much so, in right. fact. Right. And, right? Yeah. We're making it marginally more expensive. And so we're not actually taking away, we're not changing the healthcare system entirely, right? We're giving, I mean, in, in a very general sense, we're giving people the same access that they always had, and we're just asking them to pay a little bit more so that everybody else can have that access too. 
Right. And I'm with you there. And, and especially in the version of the health care bill that has been passed, I think that's what it achieves. Right. Because we 